Welcome back, everyone. On this episode of Duty and Valor, I'll tell you the story of a man who joined the U.S. Coast Guard for the sole purpose of saving lives. A man who would disregard his own safety and continually volunteer for dangerous missions. A man who would do more than was asked of him, and he would sacrifice his life to extract a battalion of Marines at Guadalcanal. This is the story of Medal of Honor recipient U.S. Coast Guardsman Signalman First Class Douglas Monroe. Douglas Monroe was born in Vancouver, Canada on October 11, 1919 to parents James, an American citizen, and Edith, who emigrated from England. And at the age of three, his family moved to Washington State. He was an accomplished musician and mastered the trumpet, harmonica, as well as percussion instruments. He was a member of the Sons of the American Legion Drum and Bugle Corps and was a member of the wrestling team at Clee Ellum High School. Following high school, he attended Central Washington College of Education, as he wanted to remain close to home so he can continue to be a part of the Drum and Bugle Corps. By 1939, Monroe wanted to join the military, and his sister said that he chose the U.S. Coast Guard so he could save lives. He would receive his basic training at Coast Guard Air Station Port Angeles in Washington, and while there he met Ray Evans, and the two quickly became friends. Evans served beside Monroe for the entirety of Monroe's military career. The two were inseparable and were given the nickname of the Goldust Twins by fellow shipmates. Monroe was first assigned aboard the Cutter Spencer, but by the summer of 1941, war was looming with the Japanese. Monroe and Evans volunteered to join the attack transport USS Hunter Liggett, where it would eventually be sent to what would be the Pacific Theater of World War II. By 1942, the Hunter Liggett was in the waters off the Solomon Islands. These islands were a crucial location that the U.S. needed to capture and use as a staging point to push the Japanese back to their home islands. In preparation for the imminent amphibious attacks, both Evans and Monroe volunteered to join others in training to helm the boats that would be used to transport U.S. Marines ashore. In addition, Monroe received training as a signalman which meant he would be responsible for communications between the ships and the men ashore. He was then attached to a marine unit in an attack during the Guadalcanal campaign, where he safely landed all of the marines. Following this action, Monroe and Evans volunteered to support U.S. naval staff at Naval Operating Base Cactus at Lunga Point on Guadalcanal's north coast. Cactus was used as a communication relay point between the ships and the men ashore. On September 20th, Monroe quickly volunteered to lead a waterborne search and rescue operation to find the crew of a Navy aircraft that went down off Savo Island. His boat faced heavy Japanese fire from land, but Monroe was able to navigate his craft to limit the injuries to his crew, and they only sustained minor injuries. The flight crew was ultimately found and rescued by a naval float plane. A week later, on September 27th, Monroe was given command of two LCTs, which are landing crafts used to transport tanks to support amphibious assaults. In addition to the LCTs, he was also in command of eight Higgins boats which transported three companies of the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, who were leading the main assault. The landings were supported by the destroyer USS Monson, which pounded Japanese positions to allow the Marines to safely make landfall in advance. All of the Marines landed safely ashore, so the landing craft all returned to Lunga Point except for one which remained to evacuate any injured men. This sole boat was manned by Evans and Navy Seaman Samuel Roberts. As the ship was close to shore, they were a target for the Japanese. Without any advanced warning, the Japanese opened up on them with a heavy machine gun. The boat was damaged, but Roberts was able to make emergency repairs that made it operational again. But unfortunately, he was gravely wounded and died. Thanks to Robert's efforts, Evans was able to retreat at full throttle, and he was able to make it back to Lunga Point, where he communicated what was transpiring ashore. Also around this time, a group of Japanese bombers forced the USS Monson to retreat. Now lacking heavy support from the destroyers, the Marines faced a heavy counterattack by the Japanese. The Japanese were trying to isolate the Marines while cutting them off from any possible escape. The Marines lacked radios and couldn't communicate their situation to others, so they had to resort to laying down their undershirts on a hillside spelling out the word help. Thankfully, a Navy pilot had seen the message and communicated it back to Lunga Point. 
Thanks to Evans and the Navy pilot, the men at Lunga Point quickly devised a plan to get the Marines evacuated. When Monroe was asked if he would take command of the mission, he responded, hell yes. He was given command of ten boats that would make their way back. They knew that they would face heavy enemy fire when they arrived, but that didn't slow them down, and as soon as they entered the bay, they were immediately fired upon. By this point, the Monson had returned and cleared a path to the beach for the Marines. This path was narrow and the Japanese occupied all three sides of the bay, so any Marines and any incoming or departing boats would be fired upon from multiple directions. Monroe was in direct command of one landing craft and used its 30mm machine gun to lay down suppressing fire so the men could safely get aboard the other landing craft. To Monroe, his actions so far weren't aiding the Marines enough, so he guided his landing craft closer to shore to place it between the Japanese and the Marines to shield them from enemy fire. During the evacuation, another boat was grounded, so Monroe gave the command for the other landing craft to try and free it. Again, Monroe maneuvered his craft and placed himself between the Japanese and the stranded boat, acting as a shield. At this point, Evans had noticed a Japanese machine gun crew setting up position and ultimately taken aim at the landing craft. Unfortunately, Monroe couldn't hear Evans' warning shouts, and he was shot in the base of his skull and fell unconscious. The boat was eventually freed and the landing crafts withdrew with the Marines. Evans reported that Monroe briefly regained consciousness, and in his final words asked, Did they all get off? When Evans nodded in confirmation, Monroe smiled before ultimately passing away on the landing craft. Thanks to Monroe's leadership, as well as the heroism of all the Marines and the men involved in the evacuation, they were able to safely evacuate 500 Marines. These same Marines would go on to eventually defeat the Japanese at Guadalcanal. The next day, Ray Evans placed a cross which he had built upon Monroe's grave where he was buried at Guadalcanal. Due to his actions that day, Signalman First Class Douglas Monroe was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. At a ceremony at the White House on May 24, 1943, President Roosevelt presented the medal to his parents. To date, he is the only U.S. Coast Guardsman to receive our nation's highest military honor, and his name is on the Wall of Heroes at the National Museum of the Marine Corps, the only non-Marine to be honored in this way. On the day after the White House ceremony,